Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar on how to use FSTA on the EBSCO platform. Our presenter today is Carol Hollier, Senior Information Literacy and Outreach Manager. Carol joined the IFAS team in September last year and has over 10 years of experience as an instruction librarian at universities in the UK and US. After Carol's tutorial, we will have a Q&A, so if you have any questions for us, please send them in using the chat facility at any time during the webinar. My name is Rihanna Gamble and I will be on hand on live chat throughout. Now, Carol, over to you. Okay, thanks, Rihanna. Um, hello, everybody. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Uh, before I start, I just want to tell you that, like many people in the world right now, I'm working from home and I'm in a very full house. And so please excuse any background noise you hear. So hopefully my family will be relatively quiet, but uh, I can't guarantee it. So um, now I will dive into my presentation for you. What I'm going to do this afternoon is first give you an overview of the information that you will find in FSTA so that you know what you can search, what, what kind of results you might get back when you search there. And then we'll go into the EBSCO platform and look at how you actually do your searching um, in FSTA and how you can do it efficiently and effectively. So uh, we'll look at the basic search function. We'll look at the thesaurus, uh, which is a really key and special part of FSTA. And then we'll look also at the advanced search and also at additional resources that we have to support you after this webinar is over. So looking at FSTA's sources, so what is indexed in there, it is like almost any other database, mostly journal articles. And that's because research outputs are mostly reported in journal articles. And so it's not all we have, though you can see that we also have quite a few patents that are indexed within FSTA and also reviews and conference proceedings. And one reason that we include the patents is because it's a way for you to get a view of information research that's being done, not at universities necessarily, but maybe in an uh, in industry where it's something where people don't want to share all of their industry secrets, but yet when they have the result, they patent it so that you can get a view into the research that they're doing that way. So if we look at it from another angle, the content in FSTA, you can see that we've got it divided up into all sorts of different food commodities, not surprisingly since it's food science and technology abstracts. So we have a lot of fruit, vegetable and nuts content, a lot of alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages content. But if you look at this slide, you can see we really run the whole spectrum of kinds of food out there, including pet foods. So not just stuff for human consumption. So now, if we look at it in terms of sciences, we have both pure and applied sciences. So there are things to do with nutrition and health. So quite a lot of focus on food research has to do with how it affects human bodies or pet bodies. But we also look at things about food processing, the analytical techniques, the all important sustainability, packaging, issues of food fraud and authenticity, and then also getting into the more of the pure sciences, things around ke uh, food chemistry, genetics, and biotechnology and nanotechnology. So there's really all sorts of different levels at which the food science is explored and, the, and also the science of uh, health and nutrition. So if we want to look at it from yet another angle, you can see how very multidisciplinary the database is. So there's, there's information about the psychology around food, um, but also engineering and chemical engineering. Um, there's, there's a lot about agricultural sciences in as far as it affects this food that we eat. 
water sciences, nutrition, etc. So how do we get all this content and coverage into the database? Well, we have a team of expert scientists that is our editorial team. And that's what makes FSTA trusted by academics and scientists and industry around the world. So our sources are vetted for quality. We know that there's no predatory journals in FSTA because we have actually people looking at them and checking the journal quality to make sure that we're not inadvertently including information that's not sound, science that's, that's not sound. We now have more than 1.5 million records in the database uh, and we update it on a weekly basis. Um, so we add about 1,700 records a week, although I think recently it was up to 1,800 records in a single week. We get coverage from around the world. And as I just mentioned, it covers food commodities and the pure and related sciences having to do with food and health. So one thing though that you won't find in FSTA is something like a lunch menu so this is something that Google Scholar has, um, has actually included in their indexing. And this lunch menu at the Blue Goat, they claim has been cited in all of these various actually scholarly works, such as things about phobia, things about fusarium and tulips, things about um, geochemistry. So if you look at those, resources, you can't actually find any citations related to the lunch menu. So this is a this is just funny, but actually real example of the difference that the quality checking of our editorial team makes. And here's something else that you won't find something written by Mac slices, uh, spaghetti, broccoli and soft cheese. We'll get back to something more serious here. When you're using FSTA to search, the thing that really drives the searching is the comprehensive indexing that our editorial team does. The database is powered by the thesaurus. So the, what this means is that every record has been deep indexed, uh, which means that it's looked at not just with the title and abstract and any author supplied keywords, but we actually find the keywords that describe the essence of what the article is about. Doing this helps you be able to search really effectively and efficiently. So we have more than 1300 different thesaurus terms or subject headings in our thesaurus. And so now I'm going to move into the database itself and show you how you can find the information that you need. So bear with me for a moment. So here I am in the database. And when we get into it, it's a very simple interface here. You open it up and the default is basic search. And so it looks like many other databases or like a Google search, um, but it works slightly differently than you might expect it to work at this level. So what I'm going to do at this point is go through all the different elements of searching and explain how it works, things that are useful to know to use it effectively, and how you can pull it together to make your searches do what you're expecting and wanting them to do. So we'll start with a basic search. And here you can take several different approaches, but it's not obvious that you can take different approaches right at this stage. So you could do something like do a search like how effective is caffeine as an air 
psychogenetic aid. So does it help you run faster? And I spelt it wrong, excuse me. Here, if you type that in like that, you will actually get some results, but you'll see here that it shows me two different ways that it ran my search. So it did it first as a Boolean or phrase and phrase search, and it got no results. And so it automatically switched to something that's called smart text searching. And when it did that, it got 154 results. And so if we want to understand what this means, we can actually go back to basic search. And if we click the search options under the basic search, it gives us some really useful information because we can see how our search is set up. So here, the default is Boolean phrase, and then there's a find all my search terms option, um, find any of my search term option or smart text searching. And the hint there, is useful. It says enter as much text for your search as you want. So you can use a phrase or a sentence like I did, um, or you could even put in a whole page that you copied from somewhere else. And it searches the EBSCO databases only. So in this case, the only EBSCO database I'm in is FSTA. But if you're at a university library, you might have um, access to more, more subscriptions that are sort of all hooked up together. So you can see here searching FSTA and then choose databases. So I don't have any other options, but if you're at a university, you probably will have more options there. So there are a number of things, things to know. So if you want to do a search like you might do in Google where you use a whole phrase, you definitely want to use the smart text searching. And so it did flip over to that when it didn't work in the Boolean phrase search for me. But if you're here in the Boolean phrase search, then you also have to know how you manipulate your search to make it work well. So if I was going to change my search to from how effective is caffeine as an ergogen, Aid. Um, if we're going to pull out the keywords that we want, the words we really want are caffeine and er ergogenic aid. So those are the concepts that we're thinking about. So we can get rid of how effective it is, and we can get rid of as an. And then if we leave this as a Boolean phrase, then what it's searching is words that are just left together like that as a phrase. So it wants these words to be together in a row. So, and that's not necessarily what I want because caffeine doesn't necessarily need to be right against my other concept. So I've got two different concepts here. I've got the caffeine concept and I've got their ergogenic aid. So if I searched it just as is with the Boolean phrase, then I get 14 results and they will all be relevant. I'm really confident that they will be, but they also will all have the words quite close together. Um, so it might be that some of those, like as an, might, might not be counted as real words. But if we change this and add in a Boolean and, so we say caffeine can be disconnected from the other concept aid, then we'll actually get more results. We'll get 22 results in all. So this means that our concepts can be in different fields within the record um, and they don't have to be next to each other.
and we can see where they are when we open them up. Although in this first one, I'm, oh, here it is. So here's ergogenic aid. So it is still together as a phrase, which I think is something that it's likely to need to stay that way. But caffeine is all over the place. So, and it's not right next to the ergogenic aid anywhere. So, but if we want to make this a little bit more broad, it might be that some people use not aid in the singular, but use ergogenic aids with an S at the end, so plural. And sometimes databases will automatically make your terms plural, and sometimes they won't. So when we're using the Boolean and the phrase option here, it doesn't automatically make what we've typed plural. It's just searching for exactly what we have typed. So a way that I can broaden my search a little bit is add an asterisk after the D for aid. And what this does is it is instructing the database to find any results that have ergogenic aid or any that have ergogenic aids or if there were any that might have ergogenic aiding seems unlikely but you never know it would also pick those up so if i hit search again with that modified then you can see that added on 11 results so that tells me i, I my guess is that they're all plurals um, and so they're probably still all really relevant to what I'm looking for. So this, these are things that you can use to make sure that you're finding results that are actually really useful to you um, and using the database in the way that you want, that you think you're using it. So if we, I'm just gonna copy this and go basic search again and search options again, if we change this to find all my search terms, then I don't need to put the and in there um, and I can hit search and I get the 33 results. But I think that it's not necessarily intuitive to people that the basic search default will require the and in there because I think a lot of times because of us using Google where it will put uh, an and in there whether or not we type it um, that we think that other things are going to do it for us as well. So you can do it any way you want to but it's really helpful to be aware of why your numbers or your results are turning out that way um, and knowing how to use the different options. So if we go once again to basic search and to search options, then you can see we also have some options here. So some institutions will have your interface set up so that this is always ticked automatically. And this is mostly sort of targeted, I think, at undergraduate students so that they'll only find peer reviewed journal results so that their instructors will know that they're using presumably a little bit higher quality results than if they're getting into trade magazines and things like that. And so the way you'll know whether or not this has been ticked or if you're only getting things that are linked to full text ticked uh, is when you run your search. So I'll just do caffeine this time. So you run your search and go down a little bit and there's always next to your results an indication of how what limits were on your search. So it might be that even without you having ticked anything, this scholarly peer reviewed journals will be turning up or this linked full text will be turning up so that you'd only get the results where those are um, present in, in the record. So um, 
you can, if you don't want to, if you're trying to do a broader search, which you may well be doing, then make sure that you eliminate those. You can also go into your preferences here and set it so that you don't have those on. But I think you have to check it every time to make sure that it's still the way you want to. So that's something else that you should really be aware of when you're searching. So if we go once again into basic search and search options, you can see here we've got some options of apply related words. What that means, it's really very handy. It'll do a lot of work for you for taking into account variations in spelling. So for instance, if you are searching for something about color, then color, if you're in the US, would be spelled C-O-L-O-R. But if you're in the UK, it would be spelled C-O-L-O-U-R. And so it will find variations in spelling and just include them in your searches for you. So you don't have to think about that. Apply equivalent subjects is a little bit different. And I think that the best way to explain it is to go now into a different part of the database, the, the thesaurus, and show you what's happening when you were, if you were to tick apply equivalent subjects. So we've been down here in the basic search box and search box, but up here in the left-hand corner, there is an option to get into the thesaurus. So this is incredibly useful. Um, if you tick it, then you still have a search box up above here, um, but you have then also another box here that is for searching the thesaurus itself, or as it says, browsing um, the thesaurus. So, and you have different ways to toggle your search. So usually the default is the term begins with one, which means what it says, that whatever you type in there would have to start the, the results that you've got. Term contains has it, anywhere in the result. And then relevancy ranked, does it by perceived relevancy? So I think that the most useful way to search is generally term contains, because sometimes you'll get surprised, you won't anticipate where your term might be within the thesaurus term. So I'm going to do a quick search. So Let's search for yogurt. And I'm spelling it the American way. So Y-O-G-U-R-T. And I'm going to browse for it. And there it is right on the top. It tells me yogurt, use yogurt, and that's spelt the British way. So with an H in there. And that's because FSTA is based in the UK. And so we tend to use the British spellings as our official terms, but we haven't forgotten about the variations in spelling at all. So you can see that there's all these different options that have yogurt. So um, there's soy yogurt um, and goes on to more pages, goat yogurt, you yogurt, buffalo yogurt, etc. But I want to go back to my term yogurt. You can see that yogurt, um, that's the official term, is actually a link. So if I click on that and then click on it again, then I get to see the term in its context in the thesaurus. So in its context means within its tree. So the thesaurus is, starts with the broadest concept. So things like food is a very top level term. And then it will divide into like animal foods and plant foods and go down and get more and more specific in different levels. So here we are somewhere in the middle of a tree with yogurt 
but we can see the broader term for yogurt. The next step up on the tree is fermented milk and narrower or more specific terms for yogurt are various kinds of yogurt here um, or yogurt beverages. Now you'll see over here there's a box um, that says quite dramatically explode and what that means is if we were to tick explode then and add it to a search we would be asking the database to search both the term so you can see it's ticked right next to yogurt and also all the narrower terms so not the broader terms but all the narrower terms would be included in our search so add it automatically to it so i'll show you so i just hit add you can see here it says um, it gives us an option but the default is or which is what we want it to be and it's added yogurt, but also buffalo yogurt, you yogurt, flavored yogurt, etc., to our search. So I'm actually gonna clear that out, but I wanna show you that down here, there's the used for information. So we went into the thesaurus with yogurt. There's also, it turns out, another way that people spell yogurt. Any records that have been produced in a place where they'd spell yogurt this way or produced in a place where they spell yogurt this way have been gathered up together under the subject heading yogurt here with British spelling. And so remembering back in basic search, if we went and ticked in the search options, apply equivalent subjects, and did our search for yogurt here. Then, and had that ticked, then it would capture all those additional spelled, uh, additional records that where it was spelled with um, the American spelling or that other spelling. We get the results there. So, I'm going to clear up my results. So I've got a big history of results um, and I'm going to delete them. But before I do, you can see that I've got my expanders. Um, so I've applied equivalent subjects and it's telling me which search mode I'm in, the Boolean phrase search. Since it's just one word, it doesn't matter. Um, but now I'm going to clean those out because already in my demo, I've got quite a few results there. So let's go back to the thesaurus though and do a little bit more exploration of it. So I've got to give you um, a sense. So if we did fatty acid, now you might notice that here I actually truncated my term again, like I did um, aid in that first search that I demonstrated. And that is something that can be quite helpful in the thesaurus because sometimes the terms won't be what you expect them to be. And I've found in my experience that you get more options when you, when you use the truncation. So if I actually change to a different one, dairy, and instead of writing out dairy, I do truncated dare and hit browse. Then actually some of these options have um, dairies in them and if I had just done dairy with a y I would have quite a few fewer options now you might wonder why did I get dairies and the reason is because it is one of the used for terms again but if we go back to the truncated dairy or dairies, then we'll pick up options where it's not got dairy in one of the, one of the options underneath it. So dairies waste, we've got dairies wastes, dairies affluence. And there's a tendency for the subject terms to be plural it's not always the case, but 
it often is, but you don't have to worry about it if you use that truncation. So if we wanted to search one of these, then again, we can either just search it like this. I'm not exploding in this case. Um, and you can see if I open up one, the top record, where these, these terms fall. So here, they're called keywords. It's this list. So there, these are the terms that have been assigned to really capture what this article is about. And again, even if the article itself never used the phrase dairy wastes, but it's about dairy wastes, then it would still be identified and pulled together so that it would help you as a searcher find it. And so that gives you a sense, I think, of how the thesaurus works. If we go back to it again and go to my fatty acid example again, then if we go into one of these, so I'm going to go to PUFA or PUFA. I'm not sure which way people usually talk about it. You can, you can either quite easily go up the chain by selecting the broader terms. So now fatty acids and then lipids. And then you can see nutrients. So we're getting really quite general now. Um, and nutrients is the top of the chain. So there's no broader um, term above nutrients. There's sometimes historical notes. So they can tell you that um, until 1992, the term that was used was nutrition instead of nutrients, um, which can help you if you're doing a really specific search, make sure that you capture the right the right subject terms. You can also go way down. So as I said before, every time there's a box here to explode, that tells you that there is something underneath it. So there's, there's narrower terms. So vitamins, then you can imagine there's a lot of different narrower terms under vitamins. So under vitamin E, um, then we can get into uh, the status and then even deficiency, but we can tell deficiency is the bottom of that chain. So one thing that you need to know with using this database is that if you want to explode something, so if we go up one level, say I have micronutrients and I want to explode that, that, oops, every time we explode, we only explode one level down. So if, if that makes sense. So if I have micronutrient status and I explode that, then that will include calcium status, iodine status, iron status, down to zinc status. Um, but if I wanted to get more specific beyond these statuses, I would have to add this. So those have all been added to my search, but then I'd have to open up a calcium status and I could explode it, but I can see that that gets me to the bottom. Um, so really depending, and I can add that then to my search string here, um, really depending on how, what I need out of the search depends on how many terms you are going to want to include. So one thing that's really valuable about using the thesaurus though is Sometimes you want to use it actually in a search, so go ahead and search these. Um, and then you'll, you can have that intersect with another search that you've done. Um, or 
sometimes you use it to really think about other terms that will be useful for you to use in building a search that's a keyword or a, a free text search but you've made sure that you've used appropriate words by looking into the thesaurus. So let's actually do an example with that. So I'm going to say that I want to do a search that is looking for information about how what sheep eat affects the fatty acids in their milk, which then affects the um, sensory properties and qualities of the cheese that's made out of that milk. So this is a search that will have a number of different concepts. So one thing, one concept is the feed or the diet of the sheep. Um, another is the cheese on the other end. One, another thing that's quite important is the fact that it's sheep. So it's not some other kind of, of animal. And then there's also the specific thing that we're looking at, which is fatty acids. So we can use the thesaurus to get a sense of what we want to be, what kind of terms we want to build our search with. So if we go into here and think about feed, so what are they eating? I'm going to truncate this, the term contains. And it gives me feeding, feeding feeds. I think really what I want is feeds. So I'm going to open it up to look at it to make sure that seems like what it is. And I can see, yeah, it includes, um, as narrowing terms, pastures, silage, fattening, etc. So yes, that is the sense in which I want my term. And I'm happy enough to include all of those. So I'm going to add that to my search and search it. Um, and I'll see that it has been added as search three. So I'm actually, in order to keep my searching clean, I'm going to get rid of these earlier two that I've done because I'm not using them to build this current search. Um, so now that's become search one. I can go back to the thesaurus. And so another thing that I'm thinking about is the cheese. So I'm just going to look at cheese. I can again truncate it. And right away I get you cheese at the top. They also get cheese varieties. So I'm going to open up cheese varieties. And I can see I get a really long list of cheese varieties here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on cheese varieties, but also click on you cheese. Add this to a new search, which I'm just going to leave here in my search history. Go to the, the source again. Do the same with fatty acids. And in this case, it's not on the first page. And I can tick that and I've got it exploded. So add, do a new search. And so now I've got three of my terms. Um, and so I'm going to start by searching those. So I'm going to go to my search history, combining those. 
because I've got the feed, I've got the cheese variety and the fatty acids. The problem with this is I've got all sorts of cheese varieties besides you cheese. So actually that's not gonna work very well. Um, I've got to add in something about sheep. So in this case, I'm just going to do it as my own phrase. So sheep or you. Um, so I'm saying that I'm happy with results that have the word sheep in them or the results that have you or use. And search. And so I'm going to then combine these and search them all with and because I need them to intersect each concept I want to have in my results. And I do that and I've got 24 results. And so I can see whether or not they seem like they're on target. Um, and I can also think if I want to rejig this search and look at it in a different direction. So maybe change it from just being the subject headings or the descriptors to searches that are in the title and the abstract as well as in the descriptors. And so the way I could do that is go to advanced search, clear this out and take my concept. So I've got, oops, sheep or you. Um, I've got cheese and I'm going to truncate that. Truncation is really useful. I've got fatty acid and I'm going to truncate that again. And I'm going to make that a phrase in quotation marks. Oops. And I'm going to add a line and I'm going to add feed. So feeding, it'll get me lots of different feeds or feeding options. But by not changing this from select to field optional, um, then I'm saying it can be in any field each of these terms can be. I can hit search. And as you can imagine, this will give me more results. Um, but then 64 results. So that's a number where you can look through them. But if you'll remember, I said initially that I was interested in the sensory properties. Um, and so then I can go back to the thesaurus and look at sensory properties. and look at what the options are. There's a lot of different options here. So I want to explode this to include all of them. So search. And I think in this case, I'm really interested in having the sensory properties be very central to my results. So I'm happy with my, these terms appearing anywhere in the order in in the record um, but I want to be sure that the sensory properties is something that's so important that it's one of the subject headings so I'm going to combine the search before of these all of these concepts with the subject headings and do it with and then I get 12 results and if we look at them really briefly, then you can see that um, they're very much on target for what we're trying to find. So that's an overview of the searching. Um, you can see how search history lets you combine things with ands and ors. Um, there are other options that you get with the EBSCO. Um, platform. So you can, for instance, use whichever language you would prefer as your search interface. Now, the, the source terms and the searching is still going to take place in English, but it can be helpful to have um, the framing 
in a different language, if, if, that's, if that's useful for you. Um, you do have options to change the range of um, publication dates that you're looking at. Up here, I'm going to move back to English. Oops. You can also search other indexes that are a little bit similar to the thesaurus. So for instance, you can just look at patent countries, so see all the patents that have been um, issued in France that are um, relevant to food science. Um, you can sign in to an account and if you do that, that allows you to set up uh, search alerts. So you can save, save searches and also have every time a search, a new record comes out um, that fits the criteria to one of your saved searches, have that emailed to you, which can be really helpful. And you also have the option to export any of these records into a reference management software or just you know, email them to yourself or download them as a file. So it's worth exploring the different options that you have within EBSCO. And they're mostly quite self-explanatory. If you ever have questions, a good place to go is to the help menu here. And you can see there's a lot of information about searching, how to use Booleans, which are the ands and the ors, how the expanders work, um, et cetera, so that you can really use the, the database efficiently. So whenever you want to go back to new search, you just click there. But even though we've gone to a new search, my search history is actually behind it still until I log out of the session or I I delete it the way you saw me do a number of times. So I'm very quickly going to go back to my slideshow just to show you a couple more things. But I just want to show you what um, other resources we have produced at IFIS uh, to support you in your searching. So we have published a best practice guide so that um, it outlines the principles of how to build a comprehensive search, how important it is not to be biased in your search, um, but gives you tools to do it efficiently and to be confident that you are doing it well. We also have a new service that's the journal recommendation service. So if you are someone who's publishing literature, this is designed to help you find non-predatory journals that fit well with what your research is so that you can submit your research to be published. And we also have a how to get published guide, which is aimed at early career researchers. So it has lots and lots of really useful information in there. We publish regular blog and white papers as well. So you can see that we have a mailing list here and uh, if you're interested in keeping up to date with what we're producing, then please do sign up for it there. We also have social media, so these are good channels to keep up to date with what we're, what we're doing for you and also let us know what we can do for you. So are there any questions? Hi, um, so this is, this is Rihanna. So we've not received any questions today, so you must have answered uh, everyone's questions already during your tutorial. Um, if at any time anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch through the website or on social media, and we will always be very happy to help you. All of those great resources which Carol mentioned are available on our website at any time, um, as are training resources um, that are available on demand and that's on the training page on the website and on YouTube as well. So we hope that you will find those very useful. We have recorded this, um, this session and we will be sending it around to everybody afterwards. And I think that's everything. So thank you so much everyone for joining us today and, um, and enjoy FSTA. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carol.